for Drew. And I am honored to be able to be a part of this evening. And so let me give you an overview about Heritage Giving Fund because Heritage is um, sponsoring this event. And Heritage is a wonderful organization that I am delighted to be a co-founder of along with Akila Wallace and Dr. Halima Malik Francis. And in 2017, we started Heritage Giving Fund um, in August, which is Black Philanthropy Month. And this giving fund is really designed to do a number of things. It's really to think about how do we help um, those members that are part of Heritage, and we have 40 plus members, really think about the ways in which they give their money strategically and in a meaningful way. Um, since 2017, we've been able to raise over $100,000 to donate to various organizations. And those organizations are led by Black women and serving Black women and girls. And so, Part of our work is really thinking about how do we highlight and amplify the voices of those nonprofits that are led by Black women, often that are small to mid-sized nonprofits, and making sure that we're not just giving them money, but we're giving them our time and talent. So whether that is through our leadership circles that we provide or educational programming, um, or even our informal mentoring. Um, those are the ways in which we really try to support those organizations. And then lastly, we really are concerned about our members. We have 40 plus women that donate their money and give their time to Heritage. And we want to support them, whether it's through our philanthropic education programs or whether it's through networking. We have such a talented group of women and we want to make sure that we are supporting them. Many of them are in the nonprofit space and they are brilliant. And so many of our members provide some of our educational programming and share their expertise with the general public. And so if you wanna know more about Heritage and the work that we do, go to our website which is heritagegivingfund.org. And you will learn more about our upcoming events. We have another panel that will be happening very soon. Um, Dr. Halima Lee Francis and one of our members, uh, Kimberly O'Neill will be um, a part of that panel to talk about black philanthropy. And you'll see other events that we are sponsoring. And so I wanna get to why you are here this evening, which is to talk about this vital topic about black women and girls and our health. I don't think that many of us are really aware of the impact that fireboards have on our community. And I can say personally that I had been impacted several years ago and had to make a decision about my own health. And so this panel is really an opportunity to have a conversation so that you have choices, that you're aware of what are the options that you can have as it relates to your body and your health. And we have a phenomenal panel with us tonight that um, we will talk more about this and, and give you the information that you need to make wise decisions. And so we partnered with um, a dear friend, um, Dr. Suzanne Slonim, who is the founder of the Fibroid Institute of Dallas. And so um, there was an article that if you haven't had a chance to read it in Tex Texas Metro News, I was blessed with my daughter to interview Suzanne to learn more about this topic and how it impacts Black women. And so I want to turn it over to Suzanne at this time so that she can talk about um, her work and why this is important and how she has been making a difference in the lives of women, particularly Black women, for decades. So Suzanne, thank you for being here with us tonight. Thank you so much, Russell. I, I'm so happy to be here among this distinguished panel. Uh, so I run the Fibroid Institute Dallas, which is, uh, it's a medical practice. I'm a doctor and I provide an alternative to hysterectomy for women who are troubled with fibroids. And we're gonna learn a lot more about fibroids during this evening, but uh, the bottom line is it's, it's important to have a place that you can hear all the options for fibroid treatment, and we try to pro provide that in our practice. So as you're probably going to hear, about 80% of Black women have fibroids, so a large portion of my practice is Black women, and I, I do enjoy being involved in the Black community, and being involved in a panel like this is, is very special for me. I'm, I'm very honored to be here. Um, part of what we have done at the Fibroid Institute is some legislative work. And I'm very proud to say that through the efforts that actually started with Francois, uh, through connections that uh, she has and friends have, and we were able to get legislation passed 
in the state of Texas, we had two House bills passed. It took several months and several um, lots the efforts of lots of people to pass two bills. One is a bill that designates July as fibroid, uterine fibroid awareness month in the state of Texas. And the other one is a research and education bill that establishes a database of women with fibroids in the state of Texas that can be used to as the foundation for research and looking for cures and treatments for fibroid symptoms. So it's a wonderful, it's wonderful legislation that made it through Congress and was signed by the governor. And then in addition to that, we've had uh, success with getting the city of Dallas and uh, Dallas County to recognize July as uterine fibroid awareness month. Texas is the 10th state in the country to have this recognition. Dallas is only the third city to have this recognition. And it's, it's a good start towards getting national support for uterine fibroid awareness and research with the goal of finding a cure. Thank you very much for having me here. Thank you, Suzanne, for being here. And so now I'm going to introduce our phenomenal panel um, that will share more with you about this important topic. And so our first panelist is Dr. Sheila Shutney. She has a beautiful last name and she is a board certified OBGYN practicing at Texas Health Dallas. She's originally from Chicago and moved to Dallas in 2007 to be a partner in a single specialty group, GYNOB Associates. She graduated from St. Louis University School of Medicine in 1999 and completed her OBGYN training in Chicago, Illinois at Rush University in 2003. She first came to Dallas in 2004 for one year pelvic surgery fellowship, where she focused on honing her surgical skills. Currently, she practices general obstetrics, obstetrics, excuse me, and gynecology with a particular focus on benign, minimally invasive gynecological surgery. In addition to her clinical responsibilities, she is currently the president of the medical staff at Texas Health Dallas. She is married with two stepchildren. Dr. Sheila, thank you for being here with us. Our next panelist is Dr. Quinita Crabble. She is, um, or she has made it her goal to provide women with the quality of care that earns their trust and considers it a privilege to participate in their healthcare decisions. She provides obstetrical care, I cannot say that tonight, including 3D, 4D ultrasound, minimally invasive surgical procedures with the Da Vinci robotic system, routine gynecological exam examinations, contraception, and much more. She currently practices at Texas Health Presbyterian Hospital of Dallas. She trained in Kansas City, where she also attended medical school. Dr. Crabble is board certified in obstetrics and gynecology, a member of the American College of Obstetrics and Gynecology the American Academy for Gynecological Laparoscopistry, and we'll keep going, and the Medical Association. Quote, I'm honored to serve the women of Dallas and count it a privilege to be chosen as their doctor, says Dr. Crabble. Our next guest is Paige Jackson. Paige is the clinical director of Abide Women's Health Services, which is doing incredible work in South Dallas. She is a graduate of Mercy and Action College of Midwifery, a mother who has experienced infant loss, a Black maternal infant health supporter, and the clinical director of Abide Women's Health Services located in sunny South Dallas. Serving women with similar lived experiences further fuels Paige's commitment to bringing historical awareness to and discussing present solutions for the disparities Black families face surrounding childbirth in the United States. She considers it an honor to serve Black women and their families, helping to educate and encourage them to effectively advocate for themselves during one of the most vulnerable times in their lives. Paige, thank you for being here with us. And lastly, Dr. Tiffany Jones, not lastly, second to last, Dr. Tiffany Jones, after earning her medical degree from Mahari Medical College in Nashville, Tiffany Jones completed her residency in obstetrics and gynecology at LAC USC Medical Center in Los Angeles. She gained a wealth of knowledge in fertility research and patient care after completing a fellowship in reproductive endocrinology and infertility at the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, 
Minnesota. She was inspired to become a reproductive endocrinologist because it is a growing field of medicine where she feels she can have the greatest impact on the lives of patients. Quote, I really like the research aspect of reproductive endocrinology and infertility. Compared to other areas of medicine, it's a newer field and I can make a difference in it to help men and women become parents. Tiffany Jones has earned many awards, including membership in Alpha Omega Alpha and the Nurses' Choice Award for the Resident of the Year. She has also served as a fellow representative on Education Committee and lecturer at the Mayo Clinic. She is a member of the American Association of Gynecology, Laparoscopics, and the Society of Reproductive Endocrinology and Infertility, the Pacific Coast Reproductive Society, the Society for Reproductive Investigation, and the American Society for Reproductive Medicine. And lastly, my friend, Dr. Suzanne Slonim. Dr. Suzanne Slonim is the founder and medical director of Fibroid Institute of Dallas, originally from Miami, Florida. She earned her education from Duke University, George Washington University School of Medicine, and completed her internship at UCLA, residency at the Leahy Clinic Medical Center, and a fellowship at Stanford University Medical Center. Dr. Suzanne Slonim served as the first female medical staff president at Methodist Dallas Medical Center, where she also served as director of interventional radiology for 15 years. In 2016, she followed her passion and started her current practice at the Fibroid Institute Dallas. She is the only interventional radiologist in the region who focuses solely on performing uterine fibroid embolization, an in-office minimally invasive procedure to treat fibroids without surgery. Equipped with 26 years experience in performing over 30,000 procedures, she is considered a pioneer in interventional radiology and widely regarded as a leading expert in UFE. Additionally, she is a speaker and the author of the book, Pain-Free Fibroids, Banish Menstrual Misery, Fight Fibroids and Get Your Life Back. Dr. Suzanne, thank you for being here with us tonight. And so I wanna start the panel off and asking you all a question that is open to everyone. And I want to ask why are, or what are fibroids and why is it important for black women and girls to be aware of them? And this is for anyone to answer. Well, I'll go ahead and start. Um, fibroids are benign tumors, typically of the uterus, and they're made up of the muscle of the uterus, and they can be on the inside of the uterus, in the wall of the uterus, or on the outside of the uterus. And they can be any anything from asymptomatic, about 30% of them are. So a woman may not even know that they had fibroids, but in those 70% that are symptomatic, um, they can have pain, they can have irregular heavy bleeding, they can have problems with going to the bathroom with bowel movements or urinating, um, all types of problems. Anybody else wanna jump in? Dr. Crable? Um, sure. Why is it important that Black women are aware? I think it's really important that we're aware about fibroids. Um, one, because a lot of times they are gone untreated and can cause many other issues, many other problems. And so um, if you're having symptoms such as heavy bleeding, difficulty urinating, um, difficulty having bowel movements, pressure, feeling anything that doesn't feel right in your pelvis, um, then you should have, you know, bring it to the awareness of your, of your physician. Um, and I think it's really important that we have this discussion because a lot of women do feel those things, but never say anything. And by the time they figure out that they have a problem, um, I'm not going to say that it's too late, but it, as the fibroids grow over year, over the years, it makes it more and more difficult to treat also. Also, it can be a cause for um, fertility concern. And so that's another reason why it's important that, you know, we're aware about fibroids. Um, a lot of women think that they're not getting pregnant because of something that they did in their past or they or because they were on birth control at some point. I, I hear that quite often. I'm sure Tiffany and Sheila, you hear it often also that, you know, they think the birth control caused their infertility. And when we get to looking deeper, they end up having fibroids. 
or some other issue. I mean, other things that we could get into like endometriosis, but again, we're talking about fibroids today. So it's just important to be aware about the symptoms and know that it is very, very, very common in black women. Yeah, I would, I would piggyback on that and say, and knowing anything early, you can change the avenues of how you intervene. And so we have on the panel some expert minimally invasive surgeons, but even the best minimally invasive surgeon can sometimes not treat fibroids that have, have really taken over the pelvis. And so learning um, about your symptoms, about the size of your fibroids may determine how they can be treated and how they can be treated where you're not having to stay overnight in the hospital or get a blood transfusion. So it's just very important to know early and to know that, you know, you don't have to deal with heavy periods. You don't have to go to work severely anemic. Um, we don't have to die early of cardiovascular disease because we've been anemic our whole, you know, adult lives, um, stressing our, our organs. So, you know, you have to listen to your body. And I know as black people, sometimes we ignore those things, but as black women, we're usually the leaders of our households and we, you know, we can't be sick. So learning early about our symptoms um, can really help intervene and change the course of our lives. And really knowing what's normal too, because a lot of times, especially with those heavy periods, we constantly will say, well, this is normal for me when your blood counts are so low and you're tired and you're fatigued and you don't know why. And like, well, my period lasts for, even if it's a normal amount of time, but it's so heavy and it just feels normal and it's not. And so it's important for us as black women to talk to our physicians. And if they're not listening to us to find one that does, because we need to make sure that we're heard and that we're taken care of appropriately and know what's normal for us. It is amazing what women will put up with. It's absolutely, yeah. it's just shocking yeah. the, the, how tough women are. They, they put up with stuff that men would never tolerate. Mm -hmm. Sure. <laughs> and I think too, it's important for women to know so that they can help inform other women, right? So that if you have a friend who's having symptoms, you can help them to realize that that's not normal and you should go and talk to your doctor. Um, but also like generationally, my, like for instance, my grandmother suffered from fibroids and had a hysterectomy and I never knew until I asked the questions. And so learning those things so that we can pass them on to future generations so that they know what to talk to their doctors about is, is important as well. And Paige, I, I would echo that. I think for me, it was having some friends around me who said that's not normal mm -hmm. because I thought, oh, this is normal to go through this. Mm -hmm. This is what women endure. And it wasn't. And it was friends who basically yeah. said, you, you need to go do something. Your quality of life is being reduced because of this. But it's, you know, what some of you said earlier, it's being able to advocate for yourself with mm -hmm. your doctor. So let's talk a little bit about, you started some of the conversation about fertility. Can you go through fertility treatment with fibroids? So um, you can, and but it does depend on the type of fibroids and how big they are. And so there are some patients that, um, for instance, IVF is a procedure that is performed um, through the vagina. And if I can't access ovaries through the vagina, because the uterus has pulled the ovaries outside of the pelvis, the uterus is too big, I can't get around it, then it can impair even, even egg freezing or whatever that patient is trying to do where you have to do surgery first to even get access. And then of course, when you're doing fertility treatments, the womb um, is the most important part. And so when uh, Dr. Shatani talked about fibroids being inside, I always say the uterus kind of looks like a pear. And if you cut a pear in half, you see those seeds on the inside. That's the endometrial cavity. That's where a baby grows. And if you have a fibroid taking up that space, then there is no place for an embryo to implant. So you increase miscarriages, you increase infertility, um, and can even lead to other things where people deliver early. And so mm -hmm. um, you can, but the, it, it can complicate things depending on the size of the uterus and the location of those fibroids. And that's why a thorough evaluation is done before fertility treatments are even started to give people, you know, it's not, they're not inexpensive. So we wanna give people the best opportunity for success. Anyone else want to comment on that? 
So let me ask you all this. You, you alluded to some of the symptoms. So we know heavy bleeding is one of the symptoms that exists. There's pain going to the, the, or having problems going to the bathroom. Are there other symptoms that women should be paying attention to, to be able to go, aha, I need to talk to my doctor about this. This is a problem. I would like to say, because a lot of people kind of piggybacking off what Dr. Shetani said, a lot of people don't know what heavy bleeding is. So if you're changing a pad every one to two hours and you're saturating that pad or having to wear a tampon and a pad or having to wear a poise, uh, the bladder leakage underwear, that's not normal. That's heavy bleeding. And so a lot of women think, okay, I've been doing that for you know three years, four years, for me, that's normal, but but that's not a, a normal flow. So it's important that you know, you know how much bleeding is abnormal. Um, so I just wanted to kind of to add that. But as far as other symptoms, there's a whole host of things. Um, a lot, some people say they feel pain down their legs. That's almost a, a telltale sign for me because I hear it very often, especially women who have large fibroids, um, because your nerves run through your pelvis, and so. That's called referred pain when the when the uterus is pressing or causing those nerves to be compressed. They they feel pain down their thighs. Some people feel sciatic nerve pain um, from fibroids, and and sciatic nerve is just one of the main nerves that run down your leg. So they feel numbness. They feel burning. Um, so those are that's another symptom. Constipation is another symptom that I see very often. Eat several times a night. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, your frequent urination. Some women, their fibroids get big enough that it actually blocks the being able to empty the bladder. So it's hard to start peeing, uh, passing clots. Mm -hmm. uh, I have some patients with when your uterus and fibroids get really big, you can get your, your ankles swell every month as mm -hmm. the fibroids get big enough that they compress the veins draining the legs. Uh, you, you know, because during your period, sometimes your uterus will swell up, the fibroids will swell up and things get a little bit bigger and your symptoms get a little, little bit worse. And also the, sorry, but also the ureters, which are the tubes that connect the, the kidney to the bladder. I often have patients that have um, basically dilation of their, their ureters because they're being compressed by large fibroids also. Um, another sign is um, that can be a sign is um, painful intercourse. Um, you know, when I do my ultrasounds, they're usually in the vagina because that's easy. That's the easiest way to see the pelvic organs. And sometimes when I put in that vaginal probe, you just hit, you know, you hit a wall. And so, you know, that that intercourse is not going to feel, you know, it's not going to feel great because that fibroid is pushing down, especially in different locations. Um, sometimes people even have abnormal discharge, depending on if a fibroid is mm -hmm. in the uterus, if it's starting to de degenerate, which means starting to die, you can have um, uh, a, a discharge to it too. So there's a lot of symptoms and, you know, it's up to your doctor to kind of put things together and do a thorough evaluation. But uh, I think we've heard a gamut of um, symptoms that uh, mm -hmm. patients have that can link to fibroids. And sometimes you can even get an acute pain because if the fibroids are growing and they outgrow their blood supply, then I see this more so with pregnancy, with a pregnant woman with fibroids, because you can get pregnant with fibroids if they're not invading that lining of the uterus on your own, just naturally. And so, but if those fibroids start to die or degenerate and they lose their blood supply, that can cause an acute pain for a short amount of time also. So my question to all of you is, we, we know that we're all drinking the same water, you know, breathing the same air. Why is it that black women tend to be pre-positioned, so to speak, to having fibroids compared to other populations? And I remember reading somewhere, and I think I mentioned it to Suzanne, about um, there was this article talking about hair relaxers mm -hmm. and that there was a correlation between hair relaxers and um, fibroids. What's the, the truth about that? And why is it that black women tend to be at a higher risk for getting this than other populations may be? I'll start that one off. Uh, so I think it, it, there has to be a genetic component. And when I've looked into the, the research about it, they've found two genes uh, 
in the receptors on ovaries that estrogen binds with that are different between white women and black women that hasn't been studied in other races. Two genes that that are uh, affected by estrogen. I don't know. I don't. I don't believe that that's enough to cause the vast difference in numbers. But there's also a lot of other factors: uh, diet, uh, exercise trends. So, for example, uh, we know that people who have a diet high in red meat tend to have a more likelihood of having fibroids. We know that women who eat a lot of fruits and vegetables have a lower likelihood. But it's interesting because. If you take a vitamin C supplement, that does not help you with your fibroids. But if you eat oranges, that does help that, that women who eat oranges have a lower risk of fibroids. Vitamin D, is, that probably have the most data about vitamin D. Uh, vitamin D deficiency is a risk factor for fibroids. And while all most American women are vitamin D deficient, vitamin D deficiency is more common in black women than in white women. We know that fibroids are fed by estrogen and estrogen is made by the ovaries until you go through menopause. Estrogen is also made by fat cells. So women who have extra fat cells, they have a higher level of estrogen. They have a higher risk of fibroids. Uh, the hair relaxer, I looked into that data as well. I've read those articles in the, in the, the scientific articles. Hair relaxer has a chemical in it called phthalates, spelled really weird, P-H-T-H, phthalates. Phthalates are chemicals that mimic estrogen. So there is a dose dependent relationship for women who use hair relaxer long-term, the more number of years you used it, the higher the risk of fibroids. The more number of scalp burns you had, the higher the risk of fibroids. It's not a huge risk, but it, the women who had long-term exposure to hair relaxer had a 17% greater risk of having fibroids than those who did not. Wow. Wow. Any other comments, ladies, that you have about that question or comments that Susan Exercise made? is protective. Women who are on an exercise program tend not to form new fibroids. Mm. Well, I will say that, I mean, yes, you can find fibroids in every, in any woman. I mean, it's not just Black women. So Asian women, white women, they also do get fibroids. It, you do see it predominantly in black women. And a lot of times though, where is this genetic component is that in families. And so typically if your mom had fibroids, you'll see it in the daughters or the sisters and different things. And so a lot of times it will be familial or genetic. And then there are some families of black women who have never had any fibroids. And so it's still one of those things that are multifactorial. That means that there's a lot of different reasons and you have to combine them all. And, you, and it kind of comes out in the wash as far as figuring out who's gonna get them and who doesn't. Any other comments on that? The largest fibroid ever recorded in the world was in an Indian woman. And let's talk about that. What sizes do, do are fibroids? Because I know I was told that I, when I had them, they were really, really small, but in an area that caused me an enormous amount of pain and suffering um, where they were located. What are the sizes that you all see, you know, in fibroids? Because that was alarming to me that they could be small and still cause an enormous amount of, of pressure and problems. And I was always under the impression that they had to be really huge for it to really become a problem. And that's not the case. So let's talk a little bit about sizes. What, what is it that you all have seen in your practices for women around sizes of fibroids? So, I mean, from millimeters to, I, I don't know if I've been asked to, still, I guess a about a foot. Yeah, I mean, like they're huge. I know, Su Suzanne, you've seen lots of big ones. Yeah, I, well, crable, I mean, all of us. 22 centimeters. So, you know, the size of a cantaloupe, uh, I'm sure Dr. Crable's probably seen, I, I don't know, we've all seen large fibroids, but a, a tiny a, a fibroid the size of a pea can ruin your life if it's right underneath the endometrium and you bleed like stink. Uh, it's, there's a lot of factors that go into how, how much it interferes with your life, but, but they can be, and it, and it's, it's a different phenomenon if you have uh, three fibroids the size of grapefruits versus 
30 fibroids the size of a peanut. You know, they're, they're two different situations. Your uterus may end up being about the same size, but they would be dealt with differently. Yeah, I did a um, medical mission trip in Ghana and I saw some incredibly large fibroids. And of, of course, it's women who um, are not able to, to seek uh, health care, but they can grow to tremendous sizes, even, you know, pushing upwards on the lungs, making it difficult to breathe. Um, but it's important to realize that they start off, all fibroids start off as one cell, smaller than the grain of a mustard seed. Mm -hmm. And so that's why when we talk about symptoms and understanding and listening to your body and knowing what's right and what's not right, um, you can catch it before it gets to that type of progression, especially in this healthcare system where we actually um, do have... Um, medical um interventions i'll so say let's talk about oh go on please go i'm sorry i'll just say really quickly that i they're right i've seen everything but what amazes me is the women who have huge fibroids not all of them but a lot of times i'll see women with extremely large fibroids their uterus and we always compare it to a weak size of a pregnancy so their uterus will be you know, let's say 25 week size uterus, like they have a 25 week pregnancy and they'll say, well, I really don't feel anything. My doctor, I'm not having any symptoms. My doctor just found it on my exam. And then I'll have women with, you know, like, like Suzanne said, uh, you know, 10 small fibroids who are bleeding like crazy and uh, having a lot of pain and things like that. So there's really no you know, rhyme or reason. There's no, no algorithm that I can put together. But what I always tell my patients is, you know, depending on the size, you know, if, if it's huge, you want to do something about it before it gets really big, because then it makes it more difficult to treat. But all the women that I treat, one of my famous lines is about quality of life. If your quality of life is affected, I don't care what size your fibroids are, we should do something about it. Um, and there's a lot of options. So I don't say if you're if it's affecting your quality of life, you should have a hysterectomy. I say if it's affecting your quality of life, we should do something about it. And then we talk about what options are there. And I honestly go through each option and let them know why this is good versus that which option is the best for their life. Every woman is the same, or excuse me, is not the same. Sorry, that came out incorrectly. Every woman is not the same. Trust me, every woman is not the same. And so if your friend did X, Y, Z, you cannot compare yourself to your friend because your situation, your lifestyle, what you're experiencing is gonna to be totally different from your friend, but your friend may be right in telling you to seek help and and seek knowledgeable help so let's talk about it because you all have kind of talked a little bit about the options what are those options that you tell your patients because for a lot of black women it's hysterectomy mm -hmm. is is what they are typically pushed to do but we know that there are a lot of options that are available for women to deal with fibroids what are some of those options they need to be aware of i would well, say that I was going to say, Dr. Slonim has one of those options that she specializes in. Why, why don't, Sheila, why don't you go through all the options, you know, just from least invasive to most invasive. That's how I usually would describe them. Well, least invasive is, is going to be medical therapy. And actually, there's a new drug that is out now that can be used for up to two years that can help even shrink the fibroids. It's an oral medication. But, you know, some women will start out on birth control pills, but Sometimes it's the estrogen that's still feeding those fibroids. So you don't necessarily always want to do birth control pills, but it's also about treating your symptoms. Um, then when you start talking about more surgical methods, well, I take that back. Other methods would be other medicines that will shrink the fibroids. The problem with some of those medicines that shrink them is that when you stop them, the fibroids will then grow back. And so it, it, there needs to be a plan about what you're gonna do if you're using some of those medicines to shrink the fibroids. Surgically, you can take out the fibroids. Before we get to surgery, let's talk, let's mm -hmm. put in IUD, a marine IUD, for example, that sometimes can manage the symptoms. Uh, in, in some settings, endometrial ablation, if, if you're not dealing with bulk symptoms, if it's more bleeding, that may be an option. Uh, and then I would go to UFE would be 
the next, uh, blocking the blood supply to the fibroids from the inside can cause them to die and shrink and that can manage the symptoms. Then I would get to the surgical options. Well, I would even consider, you know, ablation and UFB kind of, you know, minimally invasive surgical pr- yeah. procedures. Um, but there's also, you know, d- taking out the fibroids and there's a newer procedure. I don't know, Dr. Jones, do you do um, the laparoscopic procedure at oh, all for the fibroids? Just- I actually perform Sonata, which is the um, incision-free version of the Assessa. Um, so son- Sonata is a radio frequency ablation procedure, mm-hmm. and um, so is Assessa, but Sonata is done through the uterus um, via the vagina, so y- there's no incisions for it. And basically, a needle is placed um, inside of the uterus, inside of the fibroid under direct ultrasound guidance, and then the fibroid is heated up and um, can be, you know, um, basically destroyed, and then it starts to shrink. And, and it really is a treatment for um, women who are unlikely to want future fertility and uh, who have heavy bleeding. But Assessa is very similar, but it's done laparoscopically. I don't actually perform that one, although. I, I don't know. Dr. Crable, you don't do that, do you? Yeah. No, because I'm able to take them out yeah. laparoscopically. Yeah. And so that's, that's the alternative to taking them out. So right. most of the patients that see me want to have them removed. Right. And so that's, and you know. I, I'm sorry, is there a size criteria for the Sonata? Um, so it, there's not a size criteria, but there is a location um, criteria because um, it's done vaginally, you know, if you everyone listening, if you think about where your uterus is and what's surrounding it, in the front of it is your bladder, surrounding it is bowel, and then to the sides are the ovaries. And so when you um, are creating a zone of ablation, you don't want to heat up things that are outside Mm -hmm. of that fibroid. So if I have a fibroid that is right against that, that skin of the uterus, then on the other side of that, it may be another organ. So um, you may not properly be able to treat that entire fibroid. Also, if the fibroid is really small and the zone of ablation doesn't get that small, you'll also be treating a lot of normal tissue around it. And so therefore I'm very cautious and fertility patients or anyone who wants future fertility trying to do something like that. But for even large fibroids, you can treat different zones of that fibroid and get a a pretty adequate um, uh, uh, treatment and shrinkage of the fibroid. But again, location is key because I don't, I couldn't treat all fibroids, especially if you're going to potentially cause damage to other organs inside of the body. So we still have some craving. <laughs> Go ahead with the laparoscopic <laughs> and robotic option. Um, well, I do open patients too. So that mm-hmm. I had a young lady speak to me today about whether I can open someone. And I'm like, yes, the uh, I think all of us can open someone, right? Mm-hmm. I think you, could. <laughs> you probably could. <laughs> you, you probably could, but but um, but a lot of women come to see me uh, for the minimally invasive surgery, which is um, I do it robotically, um, and I do it laparoscopically with three incisions. Um, and so a lot of people question, yeah, three small incisions. They're not large incisions. They you go home the same day, uh, back on your feet, back at work in two weeks. Um, so a lot of women ask me, how do I remove the fibroids? And so once I take them out of the uterus, I put them into a bag, um, a surgical bag, and then I pull them out through, actually for, through a small hole in the belly button. I don't use a power morselator. I use a regular scalpel. Um, and there's a technique that I use that gets them out quickly. Um, and so, yeah, back on your feet quickly. Um, two weeks, two weeks downtown max. It can be shorter than that, but that is an option, a very viable option. And I want to note too, that a majority of my patients who are trying to conceive do conceive and have very, very, very normal pregnancies. The only issues that we have to do a C-section, a cesarean section at 38 weeks. Um, So all my patients know that when I'm consulting with them prior to surgery, that we will have to do a cesarean section. And then some people say, well, if I'm gonna have a C-section anyways, a C-section scar, why should I do it laparoscopically? Well, at the time that you have the the fibroid removal, the recovery is much better, Mm -hmm. much, 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 much better. And when you're recovering from a cesarean, you're taking care of a baby. I know it sounds 
daunting, but it actually gives you more time um, to recover. So, um, Dr. Tiffany. So I also, um, you know, we, we brought up hysterectomy at first and I'm a fertility special. So I'm, I'm like always anti-hysterectomy. I need that uterus. I, you know, I got to put a baby in there. That's what we do. But um, there, are pro there are lots of women who hysterectomy is the best option for mm -hmm. them. And so when we talk about options, we talk about all the options. And just like Dr. Crable said, you know, every woman is different and we don't, you know, um, our sisters, we don't tell them that their, their choice is wrong. You know, mm -hmm. but if a doctor is only giving you one choice, then they are wrong. Mm -hmm. I had a young lady, Absolutely. 30, and she had five very small fibroids. And the one that was causing the most issues was a submucosal in that cavity where the baby would grow. It was two centimeters submucosal. And he told her she needed a hysterectomy. And I said, girl, light him up on this review because this is wrong, mm -hmm. you know? And so, you know, luckily she had a support system around her that told her to get a second mm -hmm. opinion. And that second opinion happened to be me. And then we were able to treat that minimally invasively just with a hysteroscopic procedure that removes the fibroid that is harming her. And sometimes you can leave the rest of them mm -hmm. alone because again, we're trying to we have a, a goal, you have symptoms and you're trying to treat that. And sometimes you can leave other ones be mm -hmm. and, and watch them. And then, you know, and then she was free to get pregnant and to stop bleeding and everything else. So I, even if you like your doctor, you can always get a second opinion just to make sure you're comfortable in, in that. And none of us take offense to that. Mm -hmm. Usually you come mm -hmm. back you're happy. Uh, and then you're also more secure in that decision. And then I, it takes pressure off of me because then it's like, well, either you got two crazy doctors telling the same thing or, you know, <laughs> I told you. Um, so yeah, be empowered. And, and the second opinion is helpful and, and options are key. Lay it out. I always say a cheesecake factory menu sometimes, but that's what you need. And then you mm -hmm. choose for yourself. And don't be afraid of a hysterectomy either. I mean, if you know that you've had a tubal ligation and you are done having kids, why hold on to the uterus at that point? Because the problem is depending on what your age and you know, the thing fibroids can start with somebody in their twenties, you know, and, or all the way up until your forties and, you know, before menopause, you're, once you hit menopause, it's unlikely that you're going to grow new fibroids, but you know, depending on how old you are, when you start feeling the symptoms or noticing that you have fibroids is going to determine what you do about them and where you're, where you are in life. And if you've gotten to the point, Hey, you know, I've, I've done with my childbearing, I've got these fibroids. I may have had a procedure already for them because the problem is, is that they always leave these little seedling friends. And a lot of times they will come back and we know that. And so our goal in even just removing those fibroids a lot of time for our younger patients is to make sure that they have the opportunity to conceive and grow their families. And once you've gotten to that point, if these fibroids are still causing you problems, if you're waking up in a pool of blood, if you're having accidents, you don't wear white, you know, different things, you don't go out your house for certain periods of time because of your periods, like that's a problem. And there are definitely different ways that we can do to treat them. And so I hope the audience recognizes that one, you all are experts in this space and that they've got people here in the DFW area that they can go to and get information, but recognize that there are a lot of options that are offered to you that you don't have to just stick with the hysterectomy, that there are all these other options and not that that's a bad option, but know that you have multiple options. And so I wanna bring Paige in because Paige does some amazing work in South Dallas with Abide Women's Health Services. And I am just honored to, to know you all and get a chance to witness the work that you are doing in South Dallas for Dallas. And so talk a little bit about what is Abide Women's Health Services when was it founded? And then what services do you all provide? 
Yeah, so Abide, um, we are a organization that exists to improve birth outcomes in communities with the lowest quality of care. And our executive director and founder, Ms. Cecily Smith, who's in the audience, um, founded this organization three years ago and just had the thought to be able to create a safe place um, for people of color to be able to go and receive care. And so, like I said, we were founded three years ago. This past October, we opened our Easy Access Clinic, which is just a clinic that exists um, to provide a space for people to receive care free of judgment. But we also act as somewhat of a triage center, right? So clients can come to us and receive care. We ask for a $10 donation for our um, midwifery services. We're a midwifery led clinic for our services, but we don't turn anyone away for the inability to pay because we understand that there are barriers to the larger medical complex that sometimes people just need help navigating. And so that's one of the ways that we play a role is by just offering our services at a low discounted rate um, and being a triage unit for clients to come in, even if they are not good candidates for midwifery care because everybody's not low risk. Um, to be able to receive midwifery care for the fullness of their pregnancy, then we can at least assist them in um, seeking out obstetricians who can provide them that quality of care that they need based on the level of care. So talk a little bit about the, the midwife and the services that a midwife actually yeah. provides. My great grandmother was a midwife. Love it. Yeah, and my so great grandmother was as well. And, and it, it was something that was in the black community that, that because we didn't always have access to medical care, that these women played a vital role. And the fact that you all are training women yeah. to be in this space and do that, talk a bit about what it is and even some of the training opportunities that you're providing for women to be in this space. Absolutely. That's part of my heart song um, is to reclaim what was kind of taken from our communities historically when we talk about it. Grannies, you know, the granny midwives or the midwives who um, did the apprenticeship model without education, technically, um, they trained under their grandmothers and their aunties. And so um, they, like you said, they were the wealth of information in our communities and they were historically some of the only places where women could go and families could go to receive treatment, um, not just during pregnancy because we weren't allowed in the hospitals, you know, at that time. And so uh, when they were eradicated from our communities, we lost that education, we lost that wisdom. And so part of what we wanna do at Abide is create a place where we can uh, restore that, right? And so uh, we've been afforded or awarded, sorry, a grant to be able to help fund um, black student midwives going through the certified professional midwife route um, so that we can help grow more black midwives in our community. That's awesome. And then lastly, talk a little bit about the childbirth education classes that are available twice a month. What can a woman expect in those classes? Yeah. So when we talk about childbirth education, it's literally just giving them their options, right? And talk to them about everything up front because it helps to lessen fear and it helps to lessen trauma that they may experience if they know what to potentially expect um, during their pregnancy and during the labor process. And so a lot of our clients, because we're not providing birth services right now, we just launched our capital, a million dollar capital campaign to raise funds um, for a birth center, which will be one of um, few in this area that's led by black and indigenous people. Um, since we're not providing birth services and we help walk clients through that process going to the hospital. So our child with education classes are kind of, um, tailored towards families who are going to the hospital to deliver and just helping them to understand what to potentially expect based on what's going on with their pregnancy. Where is your okay. center located? I'm sorry? Where is the center located? Oh, yes, ma'am. It's on MLK in South Dallas, right off of Martin Luther King. And, and so what's your we website? Love, it's abidewomen.org. And you can find information about our capital campaign, our um, social media sites. We not only provide midwifery care and childbirth education classes, the childbirth ed is free um, to families, but we also provide material goods support. So diapers, wipes, formula um, to the entire Dallas County. And that's without income limit. Anyone who needs those services, we're getting ready to start that back up. 
Um, and so anyone who needs those services, they'll be able to find that link on our website here soon to fill out a request form. And we draw, that's a contactless porch delivery. So we have volunteers who deliver and drive all over Dallas County. We serve about 50 to 60 families a week um, through that program. And it's fully funded by our, don our donors um, who buy things off of our Amazon wish list and help us to provide those services and those items to our families, in addition to some of our community partners who provide us with items. Is there a way that we can donate also, Paige? Absolutely, yes, ma'am. Um, on our website, like I said, we have our um, information for our capital campaign, but also we have links to our Amazon wish list where you can go and just purchase items and those things are shipped to us. We okay. often get calls about, you know, shipments at the post office. And so we just have to go up to the post office and get our, get our shipment. That's awesome. Yeah, thank you. You're doing great work. And Heritage is so pleased to be able to partner with Abide and, and work with this amazing organization that we were able to fund. And so, ladies, I want to say thank you. I'm going to turn it over to Akila for the last part of our program. You all were spectacular. So thank you. It makes me feel good to know that there are women who care because it's been so difficult in our history to be able to have access to medical care. And then to also have people that understand you and care about you, mm -hmm. I celebrate you all. So thank you for what you are doing to bless people and make a difference in our community. So thank you all. Akila. Wonderful. Oh my goodness. First, thank you so much to everyone, um, to all of the panelists. Um, as I said in the chat, you're phenomenally brilliant. Um, you are gems um, to our communities, um, to the families um, that you are um, bringing life to, um, bringing, contributing to purpose, renewed um, self-esteem, spirit, like just everything, um, the removal of pain, frustration, uh, you know, all of the things that uh, women, um, and even I'm sure some young girls um, have, are experiencing the confusion, the, you know, all of the things. So thank you for all that you do um, to uh, directly impact the lives of women and girls, um, as well as um, specifically the black community um, as a whole. Um, so based on the panel, you know, we want to make sure that everyone um, leaves this evening with some very clear, um, you know, calls to action. You know, I'm sure many of you were taking notes and um, this, this uh, webinar will be available on the Heritage Giving Fund YouTube channel, so you can come back and refer to all of the various nuggets that were dropped um, here this evening. Um, but one in particular that we want to make sure um, as a collective that we leave you with is, uh, well, one of several, but the first being advocate for your body. Um, if you or someone you know was advised to get a hysterectomy, um, you are free to consult with a second opinion. It may not even be a, a, whatever the uh, suggested treatment is, feel free to consult with a second um, opinion. Because if something within yourself doesn't feel right about the proposed treatment, it may not be right. Um, so please advocate for your body. Um, make sure that you, um, all of us are getting our well women exams. You know, you, you know something seems a little off or maybe you just feel perfectly fine. You're, you're healthy and everything's great. But that doesn't necessarily mean that internally that there isn't a, um, an issue that might need to be addressed. Or just often it isn't about being um, proactive um, or reactive, it's about us being proactive. And so we wanna make sure that we're just, you know, mindful of what's taking um, place within our entire body. Um, and then also we wanna encourage um, everyone to, you know, follow up on the legislation um, that was presented in the beginning. Um, kudos to Texas, um, you know, for passing, you know, um, and recognizing Fribroid Awareness Month in July, as well as um, making the necessary steps to advance um, data and research and, you know, and analysis um, of fibroids and, and especially on its impact on Black women. Um, if you are in um, another state um, or possibly not in the city of Dallas or one of the three cities here in the state of Texas that were um, mentioned that have passed this legislation. Um, please reach out to your legislators, um, to your lo local and state officials um, to ask them, hey, do we have anything in place, you know, that clearly states, you know, that this is a, um, a key issue that uh, all of us should be mindful of uh, and that you know, the community should be aware of, and as well as that um, the medical experts are very much um, taken into consideration. And so follow the legislation. And then also 
Um, I want to invite everyone to join Heritage Giving Fund. I'm a Black Women's Giving Circle in supporting Abide Women's Health Services. As they share, they are um, raising dollars for you know some phenomenal work as well as um, for a facility. And so we want to join them in making sure that they can make this happen for our community. So please um, go to their website. Um, what was it again? I want to make sure I say Abide Women. Abidewomen.org. And then Cecily dropped it in the comments as well. Absolutely. So please go to their website, make contributions, as well as reach out to these wonderful women to see what volunteer opportunities they may have. Um, I know there's a variety of expertise um, that may be represented in, in this uh, in the chat and uh, attendance and those who are seeing this recording. You know, you don't have don't say, well, I'm not in the medical field, so I don't know what I can contribute. I don't know anything about you know babies or anything. However, there may be some accountants, there may be some marketing people, there may be event planners, there may be those who are experts in fundraising who can assist in their on their boards and committees. Mm -hmm. Reach out. We have to wrap our arms around our organization organizations um, that are serving um, our people. And then lastly, August is Black Philanthropy Month. If you're not aware of it, go to blackphilanthropymonth.com and read up on it. This is a phenomenal opportunity where nationally and internationally, we have a month dedicated to celebrating the historic and present day contributions of Black philanthropists and charitable causes. So in that same vein, um, we have that because you also will consider making a donation to Heritage Giving Fund, helping to pool your re resources together with our members and our friends and supporters so that we can continue to provide annual grants to Black women-led organizations um, that predominantly serve Black women and girls. And so thank you again to the entire panel. Thank you to all of our registered guests. Um, we just appreciate all of you and the way that we are intentionally centering the needs of Black women and girls um, each day, um, but especially during Black Philanthropy Month. And so again, please follow all of the speakers. Their information is available on um, the heritagegivingfund.org slash events page. Where you can see their bios and contact information. Follow up with them if you have questions regarding the, um, some of the techniques and treatments um, and services that they have brought up on this evening. If you're still not quite sure, reach out to them, um, as well as we want to thank uh, the Fibroid Institute of Dallas and our dear friend um, Pam Gerber, who also was contributing to this planning team. And so, yes, <laughs> she's over in the corner. And so, again, thank you so much to everyone. I, I believe we were able to um, touch on all of the questions um, in the chat. However, if your question is still not addressed, please feel free to reach out to any of the, um, the, um, to the doctors and specialists on the panel today. So wonderful. Thank you. Everyone have a great evening and we will see you again at the next um, Heritage Giving Fund event. Check out our events page. Uh, we have another session on funding equity on next week on August 25th, as well as we have a session in September, I believe on September 9th, where we'll be talking about uh, what does it take to um, be a startup nonprofit. So again, check out our resources uh, and consider making a contribution so that our members can continue to provide resources like this for free to the community. Take care, everyone. Good night. Thanks. Thank you.